Good morning and welcome to Talk Wildlife and another one of the Kruger National Park specials with Robert from Outlook Safaris. Hiya Robert. Hi Alan. How are you doing? doing? Well thanks. Good? Yeah good. good. Glad to hear it. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the little five but given the last few videos I'm just going to clear up the difference between the little five and the small five. The small five are basically just the young of the big five. The little five are a completely different set of species and include a reptile, a couple of inverts, a bird and a mammal. So the first question has got to be now, uh, this is this is for you, Robert, and it, it's, it's more a discussion than a, a question. Um, and it, it's a, a sort of sceptical one, and that is, who came up with the little five? And have they just basically done it as just sort of a little marketing thing um, based on the fact that they've actually got smaller creatures in the park that share the name of the big five? So is, is that pretty much why it was done? Yes, so, so I don't think there's a particular person that came up with the big uh, with the little five. As you say, I think it's just a case of the big five have those names. What is there that are small or little and share those names? And these were also species typically um, that could be quite tricky to find. Uh, so they shared some value with the big five. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's quite clever. I quite like it. Um, and we do have in there a very ferocious predator, probably as ferocious as a lion. But we'll come to that one. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll start off, I'll say off top of the and then we'll talk about um, the little five and just give people an idea of what they are and roughly where they might be able to find them. I mean, some of them are spread through the park, but just to give an idea of, of what they are, so a quick overview, really. So I'll just share screen. So you have to start with a cute one first. So. <laughs> Are you still seeing me OK there, Robert? Yes, I'm seeing that great. Oh, excellent. Right. OK, so we'll start off with a cute one. This is an elephant shrew. Um, now, people will sort of straight away see the word uh, elephant shrew and, and they'll know what the pattern is going to be for these five creatures. Each of them share a name with one of the big five. So elephant shrew, clearly very small, um, but are they widespread through the park? And I believe there's three species in the Kruger. So could you just give us a quick overview of them? Yeah, sure. Uh, so just to quickly say that uh, the little five, another, I think uh, um, what, what the marketing of the little five has helped is that because the big five demands so much attention or people are so fixated with the big five, it's a nice way to distract people from the big five and to say, but there are little things in the park which are equally entertaining and valuable to the ecosystem and just to, to bring some attention to the, the little uh, species. So the, the elephant shrews, um, also sometimes referred to as jumping shrews or sengis, um, which is the, the local name. Uh, there's three species in the Kruger Park, as Ellen has mentioned. And typically, uh, they are more common in the northern parts of the park, Punda Maria area. They enjoy rocky areas, typically. Um, so you get the, the four-toed uh, elephant shoe, you get the eastern rock shoe, and then the short snouted shoe, which you can also find further south in the Pretorius Corp area. Um, so very cute, as you can see there, with their long snout which is why where the, the name elephant shoe comes from. Um, but they, uh, they, they're an, an interesting species, uh, very mobile, very agile across rocks, uh, obviously enjoying the rocks for protection. It's a quick and easy way for them to, to dash, to get away from predators, which are numerous. And then they feed on insects and fruit, um, 
Uh, but they they can be quite a tricky species to find. It's a species that a lot of people are very excited to see or hope to see, but not unfortunately not as easily seen um, as most people would like. There are certain areas within southern Africa that would probably be better to, to find them, but in the Kruger Park, they can be quite tricky to find. Yeah, I would have thought sort of sitting in a car, it must be quite difficult to find something sort of that small that's going to see or hear you coming sort of a mile off um, and then disappear. But um, I can imagine the excitement when you do see one. Uh, I haven't seen one, unfortunately, but I can imagine the excitement when you do. Uh, you mentioned about uh, so just as you started talking there about the little five, um, what I thought was a really key point, and that is uh, to make people aware that there's so much more to the Kruger Park and, and indeed any other safaris uh, than the big five. Um, and that there's a lot of uh, animals as well. I and mean, you know, here's one, you know, it's it's key within the ecosystem, but it's also at food. So what is it that predates on these? Well, you'd find snakes. Um, there's even some records of the larger lizards catching elephant shoes because of their, their small size. Uh, birds of prey, the small occipiters, um, yeah, so any, I mean, they really free game for, for most of the predators, anything that can catch them. Um, because as, as I say, they're very quick and they tend to stay close to cover um, yeah. for their protection. Yeah, and I mean, they are small, you know, they're um, about anywhere around about 10, 12 centimetres long, uh, what about anywhere between 50 and 200 grams the way, is that right? Yes, that's about right. And, and remember that that uh, length that you've given there includes the tail. So body size, they're really small. Yeah, yeah, really tiny things. So that that's that's not a huge animal stood against the cliff. That's, that's a little one stood against the rock. Um, right, so that's the elephant shrew. And then we move on to the only bird uh, in the little five and obviously named after the buffalo. This is a bird that I'm not sure, I'd, I'd need to double check my records. If I've seen them, I've certainly not seen many of them. Um, but could you tell us a bit about sort of the buffalo weaver in the park and sort of where to look for them for a start? Yeah, sure, so uh, as the name says, they're buffalo weaver, but this particular species is the red bull buffalo weaver. It's the only buffalo weaver species that we get in Southern Africa. Uh, so as you travel into East and Northern Africa, you do get different, uh, a couple of different species of buffalo weaver. But for the sake of this conversation, this is the only species that we get in the Kruger Park. They are very abundant uh, in the summer months, especially uh, when they can be seen building or adding to existing nests. And that is where what they're probably most well known for are these large, very scruffy looking twig nests, which they build in communities. So these are communal nests um, that will have several males and females and they, are, or, or, uh, they can be very territorial within those nests, occupying their own chambers and, and actively defending those chambers against any other birds. Um, they can be found throughout the Kruger Park, but uh, if I had to pick one area where you can easily see them, then that would be Sitara Camp. Um, I think probably just the openness, uh, the, the right vegetation for them, but within the camp, they're very common, uh, normally hopping around on the lawns in between the bungalows and the chalets. And then you'd even see their nests in the trees there as well. So a lot of people, um, that uh, that may be traveling on their own through the park, may see these very big nests in the trees, and you may think it's an eagle or even a vulture nest, but quite often these nests actually belong to buffalo weavers. And then there's also uh, um, one of the things that you learn <clears throat> as a guide, uh, if you were to find uh, direction pointers in the bush, then typically, the red bull buffalo weavers always build their nests on the western sides of trees. So if you needed to find direction, uh, those nests, if you go to visit the Kruger Park, they are mostly on the western side of trees, but that's not 
strictly always the case. You can find some that are on different sides, but it gives you an indication of direction. Right, right. Yeah, I'll have to check my records. I'm, I'm, well, I think I'm getting old, um, but I can't remember whether I've seen them actually in the park. So I'll, I'll have to look that up. Um, then we move on. No, we don't. We move, yeah, now we move on to reptile. Uh, leopard tortoise. Now, I have seen these. I've seen these in abundance. Um, in fact, I think I've even seen these in one of the camps. So these are sort of quite widespread. Um, I think the main thing is just be careful you don't run over them. Uh, they're not a pile of dung and they're not a rock. But can you sort of give us a, a bit of gen on the tortoise, please? Yes. Um, and, and just to start off with, uh, one of the common things that people often mention when we're in the Kruger Park is uh, people refer to tortoises as turtles. Um, so it's something I, I always feel I need to clarify is turtles are species or, or, or creatures that live in water and you get freshwater turtles and you get uh, sea turtles. And then tortoises typically live on land. Um, turtles, obviously their, their legs are, are be modified as uh, paddles so that they can swim whereas tortoises are able to move on land a lot easier. And most tortoises can't swim, uh, but the leopard tortoise, as is shown here, can actually um, swim pretty well. It's got a very large lung capacity, which allows for uh, excessive air. So it's very buoyant once it's in the water. And the feet are flattened, or the legs are flattened, which also enables it to paddle through the water at, at quite a good pace. And the other thing which is quite interesting for its um, ability to swim in water is it doesn't have what they call a, a, a natural or a natural shield, which is in this picture, it's a bit difficult to see, but just where the head protrudes out of the shell, there's sort of a V just above the, the head, which is where the natural shield normally sits in that. Uh, normally keeps the head of a tortoise uh, fairly low down, but the leopard tortoise doesn't have that shield, so it can actually lift its head quite high up. And so when it swims, it's also a lot easier for it to keep its head above the water. Uh, this is the fourth largest tortoise species in the world, and you can find them throughout the Kruger Park. Uh, leopard tortoise, obviously referring to the, the sort of typically yellow shield with the black spots resembling a leopard's coat. And um, normally the best time to see them is after the first summer rains, they may come out into the roads to drink from puddles of water in the roads. But you can also bump into them in the camps itself in some areas, but they are a common species found throughout the Kruger. Yeah, and you mentioned that they were one of the biggest in the world. And uh, so how big do the, you know, what would a fully grown adult be size wise? Uh, so in, in weight wise, you're looking at 13, possibly in excess of 13 kilograms, uh, which is quite a, a heavy animal. Um, but it's seldom that you see those really big ones. Uh, it's normally the smaller species that are just a couple of kilograms that you would typically see out in the bush. Uh, I think because there's also a lot of uh, predation on these leopard tortoises from birds and the, the bigger cats, uh, not many of them survive to that 13, 15 kilogram size. They do keep very well as pets, not that we encourage people to keep them as pets, but they are kept as pets with permits hopefully, um, and in captivity, they get to those very large sizes. Yeah, right. Okay, I did have a question there and it completely went out of my head. If it comes back to me, I'll come back to it. Um, right, so that's the leopard tortoise. That's the only reptile in the big five. Um, and this, this sort of, I'm absolutely delighted that we now move on to two uh, invertebrates, two insects, uh, because to me, you know, one of the sort of overlooked heroes of the natural world, uh, outside of sort of bees and, you know, occasionally butterflies, uh, people don't really look enough 
obviously a lot of people that are watching this will because they're already into nature but a lot of people tend to ignore insects and think that the bulk of them either bite them or sting them so they're scared of them this is an incredible species so can you give us a, an overview of this and tell us how easy it might be to see these yeah so i would say rhino beetles are probably the second um trickiest of the big five to see after the elephant shrew um, they can be again it's a species that in certain areas can be very common but my experience in the kruger park it's always a joy uh, when you do bump into a rhino beetle you don't see them all too often and of course rhino beetle once again referring to those horn shaped um, protrudences from the head which only the male beetle has and they use that for defend, defense or fighting against other males. So those would be two males there. And um, as I say, it's, it's in my opinion, it's always one of the joys of being out in the African bush is to see these. They do occur in other countries and in other continents as well, uh, different species. But rhino beetles are fascinating. They can, um, it, they are very powerful flyers, part of the scarab, Scarabidae family, um, very strong flyers, a very powerful species. They said to lift uh, 850 times their own body weight, uh, which is incredible. And um, yeah, if you're lucky, you may see them in the summer months. Uh, if there's been, hopefully, also after the first rains, anywhere where there's uh, a good light, they predatory uh, beetles. So you may find them in one of the camps if you're lucky. Yeah, and again, amazing beetles. I, I think beetles are, because there's quite a few in the Kruger, and obviously the one beetle that we wanted to see in action uh, was the dung beetle, um, especially the ones, the species that makes the really big ball, um, which, which was fantastic. So we managed to see them didn't manage to see them actually in the Kruger, but I had them in my garden in South Africa years ago. So yeah, they, they're an impressive beetle, well worth looking at. And then we come on to the sort of the sort of predator that is probably as ferocious, if not more so than uh, a lion. Um, the name lion is in the title of this species. And I built it up and there it is. And I mean, you know, it looks as ferocious as a lion for a start. The name antlion, now antlion is sort of, that stems from the name of the larva, doesn't it? Yes, that's correct. So antlions um, prey predominantly on lion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, would be, that would be incredible, actually. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe if we got those same same ferocious looking larva to be the size of a lion they would certainly prey on lions uh, they yeah. prey on ants <laughs> i don't think humans would wander around the camps then <laughs> no definitely not so so these uh, ant lions as you see the insert there on the left is the actual larva of the ant lion species the adult can be seen in the bottom right corner there uh, also known as a lace wing um, and these lace wings will fly around. They live for about 25 to 40 days and they're nocturnal mostly. And they will settle on typically softer soil, softy, soft sandy soils where they will lay their eggs. And then you get these larva hatching from the eggs and the larva then form these conical shaped uh, depressions in soft sand where they uh, it, it's just incredible actually how perfectly these uh, cone-shaped uh, depressions are formed and they are, they are specifically formed in a way that will allow insects that, that come wandering by and typically that being ants, when they fall in there, they don't have enough grip to actually get them out of those uh, cones again. And what often also happens is the larva actually picks up the movement or the vibration caused by a distressed ant and they then flick up more sand from the bottom so they lie at the bottom of that cone 
in wait for an ant to, to fall into the pit. And they flick up sand to, to also uh, in, um, further make it difficult for the ant to actually get out of the cone. And once that ant falls into the bottom of the cone, it's grabbed by those pincers that you can see on the lava and it's pulled underground and, and fed on. Um, and that, that is the ant lava, um, uh, the, the ant lion lava, uh, which is uh, quite a fascinating species. You can see them also throughout the park in any suitable soft soil, sandy soils, common in the camps. Um, people often just walk across these without even thinking about, you know, what lies beneath the sand. And um, once they, that cone shape is destroyed, they just uh, reshape it during the night or the early hours of the morning in, in preparation for the day. Um, you can actually get ant lions in other parts of the world as well. In North America, they refer to them as, I think it's doodle bugs that they call them. And it would be different species, but same thing, lace wings that as adults that transform, lay eggs, and um, you have these ant lions that, that feed on the ants. Yeah, we, we've got uh, we've got ant lions over here. Uh, they don't feed on lions. They do take sort of big dogs, but <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's quite weird because you look at a lace wing and it's quite a sort of placid, innocuous looking, quite beautiful fly, actually. And you wouldn't know that in its previous earlier stage, it would be something that looks like that lava. I mean, that, that lava is a ferocious looking thing. You would, you'd expect that to grow up to the, into something sort of that was quite a formidable hunter. Like if you look at a dragonfly lava and, and how a dragonfly ends up, you know, they still sort of predate and, you know, they're still a predator. The lace wings sort of just such a delicate thing. It's just really weird. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Second thing is what fascinates me here is that we we always sort of look at things like uh, chimps and some of the monkeys and you know say you know and the using tools and and some of the corvids the crow family uh, and we say oh look the you know they're using tools and we get all fascinated about it because they're using tools in a similar fashion to we do. But there's, there's at least two species in the little five. Here's one of them that plans basically, you know, this this is it actually coming up with a strategy for predation. You know, it, it, it's building this conical depression. Um, it's utilizing sand by flicking it at the ants. So this is this is planning a strategy. You know, this this is to me much more fascinating than a crow deciding to stick a stick in a hole in a tree. Um, I, I think it's just absolutely amazing. And the other one is um, gone completely out of my head uh, that I was going to say, and I'll come back to it when I come back to you, because I might remember. But yeah, it's just looking at it and looking at this sort of, you know, this, this strategic approach this is taking to predation is, is amazing and, you know, endlessly fascinating. So what I'll do is I will come back to you. I'll try and remember what I was about to say about the other species when I come back to you. Right, you should just be seeing me now, if that's worked. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you, you, you're breaking up a little bit, but I think the other species I was going to uh, I, I was going to mention was the the weaver birds. Um, you mentioned when you were talking about the buffalo weaver, the, the communal builders, and they build this big sort of communal nest. And again, as well as the sort of strategy around predation for the ant lion, there's, there's got to be a certain amount of cooperation between them. Even though you said they then get quite territorial about their own nest hole. So again, that's something that you've got birds actively thinking about right well you know if if i build here and they build there i mean i don't know about you that that type of thing fascinates me about behavior in the in sort of wildlife yes i agree and i think with the weavers especially we've got another species in in southern africa called the social weaver which build even construct even bigger nests and although there's this competition in amongst them or amongst the male birds 
there is that safety in numbers aspect. Um, snakes often prey on these birds, but when you've got a lot of birds around one particular nest, it's a lot more eyes out for any predators. Um, and it just, there is that extra sense of security or safety when they're in numbers like that in one nest. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, again, it's not just this social element and the building, you know, the larger nests. If you look at something like the mast weavers nests, you, they're a feat of engineering, you know, they, they're absolutely incredible. And it, I'm not, I'm not belittling crows for using sticks and sticking sticks in holes and all of that lot and monkeys using rocks to crack nuts and all the rest of it. Um, and I can see why we as humans find it fascinating because it's, it's sort of utilising tools, which is what we do. Um, but if you look at something like a weaver bird building a weaver nest, you know, uh, one of the mass weavers building that dome, it's incredible, you know, and that to me, that is, you know, that is far beyond anything that's a, a sort of chimpanzee using a, a stick to catch ants and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's far more fascinating to me. I, maybe it is just me, but I, I just find it incredible what the, um, what wildlife can do. Hammercop, hammercop, hammer means have a head. A hammercop, amazing bird. I think we should talk about it in a, one of these series. You, you look at the nest they build and you, you could, you know, could almost fit a mini car inside there. It's so big. Uh, just, I'm, I'm going to waffle on, so I'm going to stop because I just find architecture and building within, well, any and, and strategic approaches like the ant line, fascinating in wildlife. So I'm going to shut up because that's a completely separate interview at some other stage. So, right. So with regards to the little five, um, clearly people don't book on a safari to go and see them. Um, but they can be seen. I know it's hard, but they can be seen, can't they? Yes, and I mean, it would be great if uh, we had people approaching us saying, you know, this, these, the little five is sort of top of our priority of, of species to be seen. It, it would be tricky, but seeing a leopard can also be tricky. So um, it's, it's not, as I said, not that easy, uh, especially your elephant shoes. But you can find them in the camps if you're lucky. But uh, yeah, they definitely can be seen throughout the park. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, while you're talking now, the one thing that is, I don't know what it's like in South Africa, it's massive out here, is moth trapping. Uh, so putting a light out, seeing moths. It, it's gone way beyond sort of scientists doing it now. In, and it's even now starting to creep out beyond geekdom. Um, I'm a geek, so of course I would do it. Um, but yeah, it's starting to really get a lot of interest in here. That would be sort of something quite interesting to do at one of the camps, maybe doing a moth trapping. I'm, I'm assuming it's not done. I haven't seen it done. Is that is it something that's actually done in any of the camps? Not, uh, not unless I think if you have a particular person who's doing some research on a particular species. Um, I'm not too sure that you would actually be allowed to do something like that within the Kruger Park, um, but uh, you could possibly find someone, I think, then that would be doing, be part of a research team. But yeah. it's certainly not something that I've actually witnessed while I've been in the Kruger Park. Yeah, I'd love to do it. But anyway, that's for another interview as well. So um, great. So thank you very much. We did manage to get through that. Um, and I didn't once call it the small five. I mentioned the little five. Um, so I've got it right, even though I've been getting it wrong for all the interviews so far. Um, great to sort of hear about a different set of animals. And, and I'm glad they have got um, you know, the little five, maybe they should make it the little 30 and, and extend it through dung beetles and all the rest of it, but we'll see. Um, but at the moment, we'll leave it there. So thank you again, Robert, for your time. And the next one we're going to do is another category that has been sort of presumably put together by somebody at the Kruger uh, or in South Africa. Um, and that is the big six birds. So I won't mention what they are, 
um, we are going to talk about them in the next episode. So until then, thanks for watching. Thanks, Robert, and I will speak to you soon. Right. Thank you for your time, Alan. Take care. Bye now. Yes.